Hello Liftoff fans and welcome to another new video. With the maiden orbital flight of Starship approaching, Orbital Launch Pad A in Starbase, Texas is being built up to launch readiness. Over a year of construction has brought the complex's various elements to the verge of launching the most powerful rocket in history. Assembly Timeline SpaceX started constructing the orbital launch pad on June 22, 2020, when teams began to install the concrete rebar for the six pillars of the orbital launch mount. After building up steel rebar for reinforcement, a steel cylinder was sleeved over the rebar and each pillar was filled with concrete, covered and then left to cure. Once the pillars were completed, there wasn't much progress on the orbital launch pad as the focus shifted to flying the SN8 and SN9 vehicles. While the testing campaigns of SN9, SN10 and SN11 were taking place, SpaceX started working on the OLP again by beginning to lay the foundations for the tank farm and associated GSE bunkers. Teams also began to install piping for the tank farm. An important milestone was reached on April 5, 2021 when GSE Tank 1 was rolled out and then lifted onto its mount in the tank farm three days later. Then, during SN15's test campaign, the construction work on the OLP stepped down because SpaceX was reaching a point in the program where they needed to test the entire stack and not just the ship. During the surge, GSE-2 was rolled out on April 19th and lifted onto its place in the tank farm. On this same day, along with starting to install the GSE tanks, the foundation for the integration tower was built and the first steel pillar of the tower was added to the foundation. Lastly, the dirt beam between the landing pad and the tank farm was being constructed before SN15 made its historic flight. After SN15 was recovered and moved back to the building site, SpaceX moved the pace up another gear and began rapidly building the OLP. Construction of the catching arms and the quick disconnect arm began on the launching pad. While the tower was being stacked, the first two pillar extensions were installed on May 31st and support beams were installed shortly after on the launch mount in preparations to receive the launch table. On May 29th, the first cryo shell rolled out to the launch pad. This shell was built to be the water tank for the water suppression system. A GSE tank would not get sleeved until August 5th when shell 1 was sleeved over GSE 5. Another big milestone in construction was achieved when the roof section of the integration tower was installed on July 28th. On July 31st, once the tower was fully stacked, FC in conjunction with the LR11000, otherwise known as Bucky, did a tandem lift of the orbital launch table onto the launch mount and teams welded it into position. The rollout and mounting of the launch table came after several months of work at the building site. Then, just three days after the installation of the launch table, SpaceX rolled out B4 and then two days later S20 for fit checks with the launch table and the booster interstage. After the fit checks were completed, B4 then taken off the OLP and rolled back to the building site to be completed. SpaceX then continued work on the OLP by starting to add piping and conduit to the integration tower, the orbital pad and between the tank farm and the orbital pad. While installing all of the required piping, the quick disconnect for the booster was installed on the launch table on August 26th and the QD arm was installed on the integration tower on August 29th. On September 22nd, SpaceX cryo-tested GSE-5 on the tank farm. After months of construction and speculation of how Mechazilla will work, we saw the catching system set up for installation. On October 6th, FC lifted the carriage onto the tooling and was constructed in order to assemble the entire system on the ground before installing it onto the tower. On October 9th, the first arm was lifted into place by FC and then Bucky lifted the second arm two days later. LOX, LOX, was first seen loaded into the tank farm on October 17th. The final cryo shell was sleeved over GSE-2 on October 19th, thus completing all of the GSE tanks and shells. The catching system was finally installed onto the integration tower on October 20th. Launch Mount The launch mount is where the full Starship stack will sit prior to launch. It must be able to withstand at least 74.4 mega newton of thrust based on the 33 Raptor 2 engine booster configuration. The mount includes important components such as hold down clamps, the quick disconnect for booster and the water deluge system for sound suppression. 
The launch table has 20 separate hold down clamps that attach to the bottom of the booster for static fires and launches from the orbital pad. For launches, these hold down clamps will release once all the engines on the booster are at nominal thrust. In order to feel the booster prior to liftoff, the launch table needs a quick disconnect mount, which is on the top of the table and will disconnect from the booster around T0. The QD will help provide the booster with CH4, LOX and helium, as well as supply external power prior to launch. The water deluge system will spray water onto the bottom of the launch mount and onto the ground to help lessen the sound waves of 29 and eventually 33 Raptors firing at full thrust so that the sound waves do not damage the rocket over the pad. Integration Tower, Mechazilla. The integration tower is going to have a unique piece of hardware. Mechazilla, as named by Elon Musk, should be 145 meters tall when completed and will have the job of not only stacking the booster and Starship, but also catching them as they come in for landings. Mechazilla will do so by using two arms which will lift slash catch the booster from hard points that are between the grid fins and the Starship will be lifted or caught from hard points right under the forward flaps. The first booster catch attempt is not expected before the flight of Booster 5 at the earliest. Starship catches have also been proposed, although whether this is actually going to be attempted is less definite. The arms attach to a carriage that connects to the tower and the column just under the pulley at the top of the tower and wraps around the two side columns for extra support. In order to be able to move up and down the tower easily, there are bearing skates that the carriage attaches to on the sides of each column on the top and bottom. This carriage section will attach to the pulley at the top via a cable that goes down to the tower and connects to a winch at the south base of the tower and a spool at the west base of the tower. The winch will be used to pull and push the arms up and down the tower so that they can catch and pick up the booster and the ship. The arms themselves will be actuated by linear hydraulic actuators. In order to make sure that the tower places the booster and ship in the correct position, the catching arms will have tracks on the top so that the vehicle can be translated into the right position. The QD arm, much like the booster QD, will supply the ship with CH4, LOX and helium, as well as external power prior to launch. The QD arm has a single actuation point which is connected to the tower and allows the arm to move during launch and catch operations. The extension has a claw setup similar to the top of the Falcon 9 Strongback. This claw setup will hook up to the booster for stabilization. And that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. If so, give it a like, subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification feature. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.